Hey there everybody and welcome back. It's almost Halloween which means it's time for candy, costumes, and some good old fashioned horror movies. But how do you choose one to watch when there are so many options? I've spent the last few nights trying to decide between watching a recent contemporary fright flick or a creepy classic. And it's got me wondering which decade gave us the best horror movies. Now each decade has had at least a few masterpieces, but as a whole, which decade is the best decade for horror? Well sit back, turn out the lights, light up your jack-o'-lantern, and clutch a candy bowl because we're breaking it down decade by decade. Okay, so this first one isn't technically a decade, but for the golden age of cinema, we're looking at movies made in the 1950s and earlier. Now, the golden age of cinema gave us some bold, daring, and really creepy, scary movies. And right out of the gate, they gave us two of the greatest vampire movies of all time, with Nosferatu and Vampire. The fact that these are silent films makes what they accomplished even more impressive, as they still hold up today and permanently influence the way that vampires are portrayed on screen. And of course, Universal gave us their classic monster movies like The Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Wolfman, Frankenstein, and more. We got some campy cult classics like The Blob and The Fly, and some paranoia-inducing alien flicks like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and The Thing from Another World. But the standout for me is the French horror film Diabolique. One part thriller, one part horror, this movie perfectly combines murder mystery and supernatural and delivers one of the greatest twist endings of all time. The 60s started out big for horror. We got creepy classics like Eyes Without a Face, which follows a twisted plastic surgeon obsessed with fixing his daughter's disfigured face by cutting off the faces of other women and putting them onto her. We got serial killer movies like Peeping Tom, which is one of the earliest movies to use the first person point of view, putting the audience in the killer's place as the murders happen on screen. And Alfred Hitchcock gave us Psycho, which had audiences peeking out the curtains as they showered for years to come and he followed that up with The Birds. Not only was this a great decade for Hitchcock horror, this is the decade that birthed the George A. Romero Living Dead series with Night of the Living Dead, probably the most important and influential zombie film of all time. It used the horror platform to tell a story focused on characters, and it put the horrors of human nature front and center. It tackled race and gender issues, and it wasn't afraid to give the audience an ending that wasn't wrapped up in a nice little bow. The 70s was kind of a launching pad for some major names in storytelling. Steven Spielberg would become a household name after Jaws, which is considered the first ever summer blockbuster and the reason that millions of people won't go in the ocean. Stephen King became synonymous with horror after Brian De Palma directed Carrie, and years before he would terrify audiences with A Nightmare on Elm Street and scream, Wes Craven shocked moviegoers with his gory film debut, The Last House on the Left. George A. Romero accomplished what so many had failed to do before by giving us a sequel better than the original with Dawn of the Dead. And it's impossible to think about the horror film genre without thinking about slasher films. And that's largely due to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween, where John Carpenter gave us the scariest killer to ever wear a William Shatner mask. Now this was intended to be the only film to feature Michael Myers, but audiences loved the silent stalker so much that they demanded him back, and he stuck around killing through several sequels, reboots, remakes, and he's still killing today. He has cemented himself in cinema history as one of the greatest villains in horror films. This is also the decade where Italian horror master Dario Argento released what many consider to be his masterpiece, Suspiria, which follows a young girl at a dance academy who begins to suspect that the school holds dark and sinister secrets. Its vibrant colors, musical score, and graphic depictions launched the film into cult classic status immediately. The Exorcist made history as the first horror film to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. The Oscars are notorious for failing to recognize horror films, but there's just something about Linda Blair spitting up pea soup that they couldn't ignore. The 80s were not a time for subtlety. Everything was loud and flashy, and that crossed over into their horror movies. We got two of the longest-running horror franchises started this decade, A Nightmare on Elm Street, which consists of nine movies, and Friday the 13th, which sits at a staggering 12 movies. We got another Stephen King classic, this time from Stanley Kubrick with The Shining, and John Carpenter successfully remade The Thing from One of the World as The Thing. And in doing so, he gave us an exciting and entertaining monster movie with perfect practical effects and the manliest beard that Kurt Russell has ever worn. 
The 80s was also a decade ripe with great vampire films. We got Fright Night, Near Dark, and of course, The Lost Boys, which pitted teens against a clan of vampires in a small beach town in California. It is everything 80s, and Kiefer Sutherland gives a standout performance as one of the fanged and flying villains. We were introduced to Pinhead and Hellraiser and the Deadites in Sam Raimi's cult classics The Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, and we were given what may be the greatest werewolf film of all time, not counting Teen Wolf, of course, An American Werewolf in London. It is a perfect example of how well comedy and horror can go together when well done, and it gives us one of the most disturbing transformations ever put to film. The transition from man to wolf is slow and painful, and we see every minute of it on screen through the use of amazing practical effects. It is nightmare fuel. Filmmaker M. Night Shyamalan crashed into the horror scene with a bang in the 90s. His debut film, The Sixth Sense, was a classic ghost story with a modern twist, taking horror filmmaking back to its creepy roots. The story follows a young boy tormented by visions of the deceased and a doctor, played by Bruce Willis, who struggles to help him cope with it. The movie delivered a twist ending that nobody saw coming when it was revealed that, spoiler alert, Bruce Willis was dead the whole time. The line, I see dead people, immediately went down as one of the greatest and most quoted lines in horror. We got some typical teen slashers with I Know What You Did Last Summer and Urban Legends, but then filmmaker Wes Craven gave us a slasher film that played off of the cliches of the genre and turned it on its head with Scream. He gave us Ghostface, a killer who operates and kills by following the rules of a standard teen slasher movie. It was finally something new and inventive, and it was an instant hit with fans and critics alike. We got another surprisingly entertaining alien invasion movie with the faculty, and we got our first look at the Candyman, who we'll be seeing again in the upcoming remake from producer Jordan Peele. But it's impossible to talk about 90s horror without talking about The Blair Witch Project. Now, love it or hate it, there is no denying this film's impact on the world of horror cinema. From its viral marketing that did its best to convince audiences that this was actual found footage of three missing teens, to its bare-bones approach, it created a sense of dread using little more than sticks, rocks, and a close-up snot bubble. And its success would burden us with countless found footage horror films for years to come. The early 2000s were a melting pot for horror. There's no one subgenre that stands out above the rest. We got moody ghost stories like The Others, The Ring, and The Devil's Backbone. We got some crappy remakes like The House of Wax, and some pretty good ones like Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. We got a surge of torture porn movies kicked off by the success of Saw and Hostel. Now that movie follows a group of teens backpacking through Europe who end up getting kidnapped and taken to a secret location where wealthy men pay good money to inflict unbelievable pain and torture on them. The Spanish language zombie movie Wreck terrified us and its English language remake Quarantine was pretty good too. They were both found footage style movies that followed a news reporter and a group of firefighters trapped in an apartment complex with a nasty mutated rabies outbreak. And these weren't your typical slow and staggering infected like George A. Romero had made famous. They were wild and aggressive and most terrifying of all, fast. The early 2000s took the zombie movie and really changed the game for it with movies like Wreck and Dead Snow, which sees a horde of Nazi zombies to Danny Boyle's adrenaline fueled 28 Days Later which sees a rage virus spread across Britain, creating the deadliest and most frenzied breed of zombie to ever grace the screen. And for all you naysayers out there claiming 28 Days Later isn't a zombie movie, it is. It absolutely is, so stop it. Just stop. The 2010s has been a surprisingly good year for horror. We've gotten a lot of remakes and sequels to classics that against all odds held up to the original, like It Chapter One, Halloween 2018, Suspiria, and Doctor Sleep a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, The Shining. Now, the thought of following up a Kubrick film with a new cast, writer, and director sounds like a recipe for disaster, but against all odds, this movie works. It's a completely different tone and style of filmmaking, which allows it to stand on its own without drawing a constant comparison to its predecessor. But it hasn't all been sequels and remakes. The 2010s have introduced us to some bold new horror filmmakers, including Ari Aster, who gave us Hereditary in Midsommar. Robert Eggers, who gave us The Witch and The Lighthouse, and of course, Jordan Peele, who surprised fans by leaving his comedy roots to pursue horror, giving us the movies Us and his debut hit, Get Out, which was nominated for four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, and one for Best Screenplay. 
We also got a strong new horror franchise with The Conjuring Universe. Now, The first movie follows a family who, after moving into a new home, is tormented by dark and violent spirits. They call in Ed and Lorraine Warren, who were real-life paranormal investigators, to help them investigate and eventually rid the house and the family of evil. Now, the series is going strong with some really great entries and some pretty bad ones, but it shows no signs of slowing down. With The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It set to release sometime in the future. Now, there are countless movies that we just don't have time to mention or talk about, but I think we got a feel for each decade and what they've contributed to the world of horror. They've each had some absolute classics and some real duds. Or should I say milk duds, am I right? A little candy, candy humor for you for Halloween? No? Okay. All right. Well, when you really break down each decade and look at not only the best films that they've had to offer, but their overall influence on the films that follow, there is one decade that comes out just a hair above the rest, and that is the 70s. Now, the 70s come out on top primarily thanks to horror masters like George A. Romero, John Carpenter, Wes Craven, and Dario Argento delivering some of their darkest and scariest works, making the 70s the best decade for horror. If you disagree, feel free to let me know in the comments which decade do you think deserves the title. And don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook. I'm Joshua Ryan. I'll see you next time.